So tonight we are talking about loops. Last week we talked about branching, how to, how to get a computer to make a decision that you wanted to make it to. We talked about the fact that computers are stupid, that there's only you only get one of two answers when you ask a question, true or false. This week we're going to continue to ask questions but we're going to ask them repeatedly. So we're going to talk about code reusability for a second. Loops are our first foray, foray into how to reuse code. And by the way, code reusability is my very favorite programming topic. Um, when I say reusable, I don't mean you're copying and pasting. You're using constructs of the language in this case loops and in next week's case functions to use the same set of code again and again and you can do that because the code is driven by the inputs you give it so the outcome could change based on what you input it also code reusability reduces the amount of code you have to write and maintain there's a metric out there and it basically goes like this. If you find a, a, an error, a bug, when you're do, doing requirements, it's going to cost you a dollar to fix. When you're doing it in design, when you're designing the code, it's going to cost you $10 to fix. When, you're, when you find that exact, exact same bug while you're coding, it's going to take $100 to fix. And if it gets all the way out to the point where it's deployed software, it will cost you, same bug, will cost you $1,000 to fix. So every time you write a line of code, you add risk. And the risk is that you did something wrong. I'm a human being. I don't write perfect code ever. I try, try really hard, but it's something that, that, that it's just not 100% possible. So writing your code to make it reusable means that you write less code, you add less risk, and you cost the company because I'm not a, I don't, I, you know, I, I work for a company and they pay me for my time so that I can code for them. So when I do that, I am reducing the company's risk. I'm making the product better by writing code for reusability. So we have some new keywords tonight. We have the word while. While is a special, is a loop. It, it is a, an indicator to Python that you are going to do something repeatedly. We also have for, which is another way of telling Python you're going to do something repeatedly and there are specific different situations in which you would want to use a while and which you would want to use a for. So um, there's also a keyword called in and it is saying is something present in a sequence? So if I have a list or if I have a letter and a string because a string is a list I can use the in keyword for Python to do a comparison. Break stops the loop and continue stops the execution when it hits the continue and continues back up to the top of the loop. And I will explain what the top of the loop is in just a couple minutes. We have some new concepts. We have the concept of iteration and the concept of a sentinel value. Iteration is when you execute the block of code that is inside a loop. A sentinel value is a value which is checked to determine if the termination condition of the loop is met because you don't want to run loops forever. You want to be able to stop your loops because if you run a loop forever, it could like use up all your system resources. There are only a very few small instances where you ever want to set up a loop to just on. You always want to give it the opportunity to exit. And a sentinel value is a way to give 
a loop an opportunity to stop. There are two kinds of loops. There's while and for loops. While loops are used to evaluate your block of code with an, an unknown number of times. I do not know how many times this while loop is going to run. It's just going to run. You will need a while loop for your game. That when they talk about the game play loop, they are talking about a while loop. Four is used to evaluate a block of code with a known number of times. So a list. Um, a range. We'll talk about ranges in a few minutes. But it is finite. Four is finite. While is not. So we're going to start with while loops. This is just my little Python script. And I have a new keyword called while. Now you'll notice a couple things in here. First of all, I have two variables create, uh, defined. The first is cur underscore power, and the second is user underscore care. OK? User underscore care is going to be used in the while loop, and that is the value that will be the variables whose value will be changed inside the while loop to alter the, to alter the answer to the question. And it has to be defined outside the loop. Before you go into that while loop, user care or whatever the variable name is that you decide to give your vari your, your, the variable you're going to test with, um, it has to be defined outside the loop. And it has to be defined in such a way that you can actually enter the loop. In this case, I have while user underscore care double equal sign, quote, y, quote, y is the sentinel value. It is the condition that I'm going to check. So what I'm saying here is, as long as user care is y, do what's, do what's in my orange block. I've got this orange block down there. Remember last week we talked about scope? So while loops, just like if statements, have scope. That scope is code that will only ever happen if user care is equivalent to Y. If you put anything else in for user care, you're never going to get to those three lines. And those three lines are in the code block of the while loop. They're in the local scope of the while loop. Um, the while keyword is an indication to Python that it is going to make a decision an unknown number of times. So in this case, if you look at the very last line of code in the script, it's user underscore care equal input. That is allowing a user on input to change the test that will happen when it's in the while loop. So you have to, inside the while loop, have an opportunity to change the variable that you're using in the statement of the while loop. So I have user care defined outside the while loop, so it's defined before the while statement. And then I'm using user care in the while statement itself. And then inside the local scope, of that while loop, I'm changing, I'm giving the opportunity to change user care. And every time I put in user care as yes, it will continue to, in this case, increase by a power of two. Um, and if I give it any other value, it will just say, sorry, it's false, and it will stop. A sentinel value is a value which defines the exit condition for a loop. So the exit condition for this loop is when user care is not the, the letter Y. OK. So um, 
Did we? No, this is a different one. Sorry. So the entry condition for a loop. How do I get into a while loop? How do I make it into that local scope, which is where the bulk of the processing is going to happen? What I do is I define the test the value of the test variable to ensure that when I say is user care, sorry, user care is equivalent to lowercase y, true or false, that that will be, be true the first time. So you'll go through the loop one time at least. So that is why user care is set equal to the lowercase y right before the while statement. Um, and don't forget the colon. Just like branches, you've got to end with that colon. If you don't end with the colon, you will get a syntax error. Um, See, did I forget anything? The input is the point at which you can change the um, the entry condition of the loop. So let's follow the values here. And what we're going to do is we're just going to look at what happens. So I have Professor Lisa. She's sitting down there. I'm using user care. User care is equal to y. That's true the first time through the loop. So because that evaluated to true, I'm going to print cur power, which is 2. Then I'm going to execute cur power as cur power times 2. Then I'm going to wait for Professor Lisa to tell me about what she wants to do. Well, I put in y. So I've just completed an iteration. I did the whole thing through the loop, and I'm back up to the while loop. So now I'm inside the loop. I'm going to print cur power is 4. And then I'm going to say, do you still want to do this? And I'm going to say no. And I will be done because I said no. So that is kind of how the loop works. But I think it might be a little easier to see in, OK. We'll do it this way. So this is also a little different way to look at how to do, oops, let's configure the interpreter, at how to do the check. So like last week, if we look at this code, we have a decision maker right here. We know it because it starts with a while and it ends with a colon. So this is going to ask Python a question. And only if it's true will I do rows 5, 6, 7. So let's run this real quick. Actually, I'm just going to do current file. So you know my favorite thing is the debugger. So I have cur power is 2 and user care is n. So I say if user care is not the same as q, as, as the word quit, then I'm going to do what's inside the loop. And again, PyCharm is really nice. I can uh, mouse over the Boolean operator, and it will tell me what the, what the outcome of that condition will be. So now I'm go I know I'm going to go into the loop. So I'm going into the loop. I'm going to print cur power. I'm going to print cur power. I'm going to uh, calculate cur power, and I'm going to wait for user input. So the user input will be 42, and it's not quit. Sorry. So I'm going to go through the loop again. I'm going to print cur power is now 4. Oh, and it's waiting for input. So I'm going to put n. I can put whatever I want. And now I'm not. I'm still not equal to quit. So I'm going to do that. It's going to wait, and I'm going to type in quit. And I type in quit. Whoops. I don't want to do that. I want to do that. Now I'm quit, and I don't do the loop. And I'm just going to print done at the very end. So what would happen? If I change this to quit, 
So the only thing I've changed, everything is the same except this one word. So my user care is now going to be quit. So if I debug this again, you will see that quit, if I have quit, is not equal to quit. That's going to evaluate defaults because they are equal. This will evaluate defaults. And I will go right to line 9. I'll go right to done. Because I didn't set my loop up so that I entered it the first time around. That this statement right here has to evaluate to true. It just does. I was just seeing who was on. Um, and if it doesn't evaluate to true, you're never going to get inside the loop. just won't happen. So be cognizant of that. If you are not making it inside the loop, take a look at what's happening. Copy your Zybooks lab into PyCharm and run through the debugger. It will help you figure things out a lot easier than trying to guess. Okay, so let's keep going. Oops, there we go. Um, oh, we, we're going to look at 421. Is that what I just looked at? Yep, 421, good. So we're going to continue with while for a moment. There's a way to use while with a finite number of things. Even though I said four was built for that, and it is, you can also do it with a while loop. And I want to do this also to contrast with how a for loop handles um, a finite loop as opposed to um, a, a while loop handles it. So I've got num printed is 0, num stars equal int input. So I'm going to print some number of stars. So what I do is I'm going to say I'm going to print three stars. So user care, or sorry, num stars is three. I'm going to print a star. Then what I have to do is I have to increment num printed to change the outcome of loop. If I don't do that line with num underscore printed equal num underscore printed plus one, then what's going to happen is I'm just going to keep printing stars forever. So I do the loop a second time. Whoops. My bad. I do the loop a second time, and then I'm done. So I had to have, let's, if we ignore the input line, I had to have one, two, three, four lines of code just to print three stars. However, if I use a for loop, I only have to use two lines of code. So I have to have. So it really makes life a lot easier if you are using things with a finite, where there, there's a set of something. So what we have here is we have the four keyword. We have num. Num is a variable. It, it could be any variable. It could, be a, it could call your variable Fred. It doesn't matter. It's just a variable. In is a keyword that tells Python it's about to expect a sequence. Range is a special function, and we're going to talk about it in a couple of slides, but it basically produces a finite number of numbers so that you can, it's a sequence of numbers, so you can just go, you can just pour over that sequence of numbers. And then you're going to have something inside the code block, and in this case, what's in the local scope of the for loop is a print statement, and it's print num is, and then format num. So this is what a for loop looks like. And if it's considerably more compact than using a while loop when you're dealing with a sequence of things. In my daily life, I use for loops more than I use while loops. Part of the reason I do that is because there, I, I do a lot of stuff with data that's finite, that comes out of databases, that you know, comes off file systems, and it's not infinite. I know it's a finite set, so I use a for loop because it's a finite set. Um, so 
Num, one more thing about num. Num is a variable. It is defined in the local scope of this for loop. So you can't use num anywhere else thinking that that number, that value is going to be there. Num is a local variable to the scope of the for loop. That's it. That's all you get. You cannot use it. It doesn't exist before the for loop, and it's not going to exist after. It's just for use inside the for loop. And just like everything, just like everything we did last week and everything this week, the for loop statement has to end with a colon. Don't forget the colon. It will drive you crazy. I was writing in Py been writing in Java for a couple weeks. I was writing in Python the other day and I kept forgetting that colon and I was like, I want to bang my head up against the wall. It's just frustrating sometimes. And also you'll notice that this required no external input. So four is great if you just have data. So let's talk about range for a minute. Range is a special function. And what it does is it produces a sequence of numbers starting um, where you tell it to start, stopping where you tell it to stop, and incrementing it how you tell it to increment. Now, when we look at what we did in the last slide, I, just, I didn't have three arguments for range. I had one. And that's because two of the arguments are optional. You don't have to have them. So you can put range, open parenthesis, close par three, close parenthesis, and you will get three numbers starting at zero and ending at two. Zero, one, and two. So you get three numbers. You don't go zero, one, two, three. That would be four numbers. Unless you tell it to start someplace else. So the start number is inclusive. It does not, if you don't give it any start number, it will always start at zero. The stop number is required. And you will only have that number of elements in the sequence. And it is not inclusive. An increment is how you are going, are you going to increment it by one, which is the standard and it is the default. Are you going to increment by two? Maybe I want to do odds and evens. So maybe I'm going to increment it by two. Um, so maybe I want to increment it by minus one because I want to go backwards. So all of those are possibilities with that one function. Um, so in a keyword used for two purposes, determine if a value is contained in a sequence. So what you will find is you can also do an if with an in. I can say if my, my some value is in a sequence. And next week we're going to learn about a little bit more about that when we start talking, not next week, the following week, week six. We're going to talk about lists. And so we're going to use in in a bit of a different way. This week we're going to use it to iterate through a for loop. Um, and range is your friend. It, it is very, very handy. Um, it keeps you from having to handwrite the sequence. You can just tell Python, go write me a sequence. And Python will do that using the range function. Let's follow the num for a second. Now, I have four num in range three, and I'm going to print it. Seems pretty easy. You don't need my, a teacher for this. So when I call range, this is what's going to happen. It's going to create a sequence, zero, one, and two. The first thing that for loop is going to do, it's going to assign zero to num, and I'm going to print num is zero. Then I'm going to go up to the top of the for loop. I'm going to get the next sequence number from it, which is 1. And then I'm going to print num is 1. I'm going to go back up to the for loop. I'm going to grab the 2. I'm going to print num is 2. And then I'm done. There's nothing more to do. There's no other checks that have to happen. I am simply done. So a for loop. Is very it's very handy and it's got more shortcuts than a while loop. Can you tell I prefer for loops? I do. 
So this is how you this is how you use a for loop. Um, a little bit more about range. You can create a list which begins with one. It contains every other number until five is reached. Odd numbers only. Well, how do I do this? And I think this is going to be used in one of your labs this week. I have four range, num in range, but this time I give it a little different. I give it one, so I want it to start at one. I don't want it to start at zero. I want it to run until the final number is six minus one, because it's not inclusive. And then I want to increment by two, which means I will have a one, a three, and a five in my sequence. And then I'm going to print that out. So the only thing I've done is from, from the last slide is change the range. So again, you don't need the teacher. This time the range is going to create a one, a three, and a five. So my first value is going to be one. And then I'm going to print one. My second value is going to be three. And then I'm going to print three. And my third value is going to be 5, and then I'm going to print 5. So you can do a lot. You can go forwards. You can go backwards. Now, the other nice thing about loops, and we're going to talk more about this on week 6, but you can have loops inside of loops. I don't think we do any with this section. Ah, I'm sorry, we do. Here are nested loops, and here's how they work. I knew I was coming to that for some reason. And we'll do more of this in Module 6. But basically, if you have a table or a matrix, you may want to have to, oh, no, 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 no. For the lab, one of the labs this week, I think you have to build a triangle, which is going to take, um, it's going to take a loop within a loop. So the loop within a loop works on the concept of a matrix, which are rows and columns. So I'm always going to have the top, the outside loop is always going to be row-wise, and the inner loop is going to be column. So to get to a row and a column, I will have to have the place in the row and the place in the column. So let's look at this example. Actually, let me see something. This is challenge 481. Let's actually run 481 in code. Why is 481 not here? Is it 482? OK, we'll run this one. Let's stop that. So this one is given the number of rows and the number of columns, print all the seats in a theater. Rows are numbered, columns are lettered, as in 1A or 3E. So here's what I have. I have, I'm going to input two different things. And then I'm going to have uh, two loops. I'm going to have, this is my outer loop. And the remainder of the, of the code is in the inner loop. It doesn't have to be, but it is. And I have a column letter A. And I'm going to say one num rows plus one. So I'm not going to make the user add plus one, I'm going to add plus one. So if I want four rows, I'm going to put in four. It's going to add five so that the range doesn't um, st steal a row from me. And the same with num columns. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to print what row and column I'm in. And now down here is just um, how to get a letter. So I'm using the care function, I'm using an ordinal function, and I'm getting um, the letter, and I'm adding one to it, to the ordinal, so that I can get the next letter. Don't worry about that. So let us debug what we have. So it's waiting for input. So I'm going to do four rows and three columns. So here I am. And when I go and look at, I have it now, notice down here in the debugger console, it has 
it, it only knows right now about variables num call and num rows. That is because cur row hasn't been declared yet, and it won't be declared until I actually execute the line of the for loop. So I'm executing the line of the for loop. Now I have cur row is 1. I'm going to say cur column letter is A. So I have 1A. Now I'm going to say for cur call in range num calls. So you'll notice here num calls has been defined, but cur call has not been defined yet. So we're going to go down, and now we're going to have cur call. And so let's see what I do on the console. I'm going to print 1A. So format cur call, comma, cur letter. Format 1A. So now what's going to happen is I'm going to go back to the top of the inner loop. The inner loop has to complete in some way before it ever touches the outer loop again. This runs fully as its own loop. So I'm back up at the top. I'm now incrementing. So my cur call is now 2, but you'll see that, I'm sorry, yeah, my cur letter. My current row is still 1. This guy hasn't changed. But this stuff is changing, and that's because I haven't touched the outer loop. I haven't gone back to line 15. I'm still within the inner loop. So I'm now going to print out 1B. Same thing's going to happen. You'll notice that blue line has not yet gone back to line 15. I am just on line 17. And now I'm going to print out 1C, and I'm going to do, I'm done. So I'm going to print because I want to make sure that I new line. Now, only when I am done with that inner loop do I go back up to the top of the outer loop. So now I have changed, I have changed current row to 2. Now here I've still got 3 for cur call and D, so what in the world is going to happen? Well, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, this line does two things. It sets where you want the start of the column letter to be. And that has to be inside the outer loop. So that before you hit that inner loop, which deals with the A, B, C, D, E, it knows where to start. You're not going to start with D. You're going to start with A. So we're just going to run through this now. Same thing's going to happen. I'm going to run through this entire loop. So I'm going to have 2A, 2B, and 2C. Now I'm going to print a new line, and I'm going to go all the way up to the top. Current row is 2. Again, cur call is D, and that's because that's where I left it. But I'm going to reset it to A. And now because on line 17, I am executing the loop anew. Python is going to say that I'm starting at 1. Cur call is now 1. And so I have 3A, 3B, and 3C. I'm done with this. Sorry. There we go. I'm done with this. I'm going to print out a new line. Why do I keep doing that? I'm going to print out a new line. I'm back up at the top of the loop. I'm going to go cur call. I'm going to reset this to A. Python's going to reset that range for me. I don't have to worry about it. And so now I'm going to go through and I'm going to do 4A, 4B, and 4C. Print and I am done. So that is how you use a, a multidimensional loop, a, a loop inside of another loop. Uh, let's come back. Okay, break and continue. Let's go take a look at an example with break and continue because break halts the execution of a loop and continue causes Python to stop and return to the top of the loop. So let's go look at 4, 10, 1. Okay, so this has a break in it. It doesn't have continue. And why in the world? I must have been programming when I, Java when I wrote that. 
Okay, so I have, uh, for each match, add one point to the user score. So the sample output is this, and then that will be the score. So what I have is I have a while loop, and I could have used a for loop, but I'm using a while loop. And I'm going to say while true, user pattern equals input. If sign in pattern is not equal user pattern, break. Otherwise, user score is one. So I'm just going to keep entering these patterns and seeing how high my score gets. If the Simon pattern and the user pattern are not the same, then I'm going to break. And I'll show you what happens when break does its thing. So let's debug my, my favorite thing, doing debug. So I'm just going to copy what they have here as the Simon pattern. And then I'm going to copy what they have here as the input pattern. So here I'm doing just an if statement. And I'm going to say if the Simon pattern and the user pattern are the same, which they are. So I'm sorry, let me reiterate that. If the Simon pattern is not the same as the user pattern, I'm going to break. Otherwise, I'm going to add to the score. So, I why did it break? I thought they were the same. Ah, they're not the same. Okay, let me do that again. So, I'm going to put in the Simon pattern. I'm going to put in the Simon pattern again for the user pattern on line 16. So now, if the Simon pattern and the user pattern are not the same, let's see what this says. So that is false. So because it's false, I won't hit the break statement. And I'm going to up the score. So now I'm going to print in user pattern again. And this time, I'm going to enter A, B, C. I'm going to step over because this is now true. So what's going to happen is I go to this break statement. And when I go to this break statement, it halts the loop. I don't go back up. You won't see me going back to line 15. I will simply drop to line 20. That is what a break does. Now, if I wanted to change this and I want to go back up to the top of the loop and give them another opportunity, what I can do is I can change this to a continue. So I've only changed one word, and that's going to change how this functions. So I'm going to do the Simon pattern. I'm going to do the regular pattern. So now this is false, so I'm not going to go and uh, I'm not going to continue. I am going to increment the score. Don't know why I keep hitting that. Now I'm going to ask for another user pattern. And this time I'm going to say ABC. So this is going to be true. I'm going to step over that. And now I'm at the continue. Now the last time I did this with the break statement, I was done. This time, I go back up to the top of the loop, and I'm asked to put in more user input. So I'm going to put in this again. And I'm going to add to my score. I'm going to add for user input. Now, the problem with this is that you can't, there's no way to stop this loop. So this is going to be an infinite loop. That's why um, I would do, I wouldn't say while true, I would do it a little differently. But anyway, you see the difference between break and continue. Break halts the loop, continue takes you back up to the top of the loop. And by the way, the same go, the same thing applies if you have nested loops. The break will only break out of the single loop and a continue will only continue to it's the loop that it's um, included in. Okay, so let's talk about some labs, lab notes. Um, these labs expand on the decision making. 
They're really to test your ability to use both for and while loops and control the flow of your programs. Um, they're still using the basics for Module 1 and Module 2, and they can, a loop can contain another loop as well as branches. So you can put an if statement inside of a loop, you can put a loop inside of a loop, you can put a loop inside of an if statement. All of those are valid. Remember still that a Python indecision has two answers, true or false. Make sure you design your questions appropriately. Um, just to say, Zybooks is going to test your labs with different values than the one provided in the example in Zybooks. Your code has to work with all of that. You have to use input and print functions just like you did in module, way back in Module 1 so that Zybooks can evaluate what you did. Zybooks can, can give you data for your program and you can give um, an answer back. Um, we're going to now review the pseudocode for the labs. So 4.14, given a line of text as input, output the number of characters excluding spaces, periods, or commas. This uh, now, just a reminder, pseudocode is language agnostic. I will be, um, however, for these, I do use for or while, depending on what I think would be best for that particular lab. So I'm going to input um, some user text. And then I'm going to, I say, set care count. Now, if you're going to use a for loop, oh, no, you do have to use care count. Never mind. And then you've got to use care count because what you're going to do at the end when you're done with the loop is you're going to print out care count. And so um, you're going to have to have care count. So I'm going to say for each character in user text, remember a string is just a sequence of characters. So you can look at each character. And then if the character is not equal to a space, it's not equal to a period, and it's not equal to a comma, you're going to increment care count. And then you're going to go back up to the top of the loop. That's as simple as this is. And then when you're all done, you're going to output care count. So um, be careful. That's what I said, inside for each and if to indents. Make sure all, all of the rules for indentation that we did last week apply this week. If you have a loop, you have to indent it. It's just it's a different kind of a branch. So you have to have your indentation working properly. OK. So um, this is, you're going to create a password. You're going to write a program that takes a simple password and makes it stronger by replacing some characters. So you're going to replace I with an exclamation point. You're going to replace A with the at symbol. You're going to replace M, lowercase m with a capital M, Cap, capital B with an 8, and a 0 becomes a dot. So this is a while loop. It could be a for loop. Um, while care counter is less than the length of the word. For, so that's what we're going to do here. And by the way, sorry, let me start at the, let me start at the top. So there's going to be an input statement, so Zybooks can give you a word. You're going to have the password equal to some empty string because you're going to have to output the password after the loop has exited. So you've got to have a, a bucket to put it in that is outside the local scope of the loop. And in this case, I've set a while loop, so we're going to have a care counter equal zero. So I'm going to say while care counter is less than the length of the word. So that's using the len function. Um, and we talked about that in Module 2. I'm going to test what the character is. So if word of care counter is a lowercase i, then I'm going to set password equal to password plus an exclamation point because password is a string and 
i as a string i can add them together and python will concatenate them it will butt them up against each other so it's just going to keep basically adding a character to the end of password and then i'm just going to go down here and do all these checks i'm going to say l if word of care count is equal to a then i'm going to set password equal to password plus now make sure it's always password equals password plus because you're changing password so you want to say my new password is my old password plus one or plus i or plus dot so that's all you do here you do an if and then you do the elif because remember like last week if there's a relation between the 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 conditions you want to have elif so these are all going to be elif so i want to make sure that i test that that letter for everything that i need to test it for and at the end i have an else and the else is where any character that's not an i an a an m a b or an o comes in that else says if it's not one of those then just have password equal password plus word of care count. And then I'm going to increment the care count. I could have done this with a for loop and say for care in, well, wouldn't have been care because, yeah, for care in word. But I chose to do it like this. You can choose to do it a different way. Oh, and at the very end, you have to add Q star S to the end of the password. Don't forget that. This line is important, password equal password plus Q star S. So that's what this is. It's a loop with a bunch of if statements in it. And there's one if or elif for each of the possible exceptions. And then if there are no exceptions, the else is you're going to create your password with the character that it gave you. Okie dokie. Um, so it's going to output a right triangle based on user specific height of the triangle and symbol character. So you're going to have two inputs. You're going to have a character and you're going to have a height. Now this triangle is going to be basically, it's going to have the same number. It's going to, sorry. Yeah, it's going to have um, the same number on the X is on the Y axis. Never mind. Sorry, I was making a geometry reference and my brain just doesn't want to do that tonight. So that's number one. And then modify the program to use a loop to output the right triangle of, um, of height, of triangle height. Um, so basically what you're going to do is you could use four for this. I don't know why I put while here. You could easily use a for loop for this. And basically you're going to have two loops. You're going to have the outer loop is going to be on height. And then there's going to be an inner loop which deals with counter. So here is the variable counter. So I'm just going through however many I have to go through. Um, and then here, and this is where the trick of this triangle comes in, I'm only going to iterate through this inner loop as many as I have counters. So if counter starts at zero, this inner loop isn't going to be hit. If counter starts at one, then this is going to be hit and it's going to run through one time. If this counter changes to two, then this will end up running twice. Three, the inner loop will run three times. Four, the inner loop will run four times. That's the trick to this. This is, I have this counter here, and that counter is what I'm checking against. So I have, an, I have this inner counter, which is the variable that gets changed in the inner loop, whereas counter only gets changed in the outer loop. So again, indentation is very important in this one and just like I changed the letter when we were looking at that example in PyCharm here I need to make sure I reset inner counter to zero every single time I come up to the top uh, of the outer while loop and then this is where I'm going to output the care 
Um, and by the way, here's a hint. You got to make sure you end with a space not a new line or this isn't going to work. So remember when you're doing the print statement and you do quote end space quote, that's what you want to do. Um, and then you want to output a space after, why did I say output a space after the first while? And then you increment the, the outer counter and then you go back up to the top of the loop. So this is very compact, but it does a lot in a couple of lines of code, which is, again, one of the reasons why I like loops. Okie dokie. Let's do the last one. So basically, um, Mad Libs are activities that a person provides various words, which are then used to complete a short story. Um, so here you're going to be given a word and some tokens, and, and a, basically a series of words. And one of those words could be quit, so that's our, um, that quit is our sentinel value, and I'm going to say while token of zero is not equal to quit, output eating tokens of one, tokens of zero, a day keeps the doctor away. That's all you have to do. And then you're gonna change you're going to ask the user to input a word. So this is one of those places where a while loop has to be used because you're going to change the condition of the loop based on input from inside the loop. So this is going to be somebody typing a new word and, and a couple of tokens. And so you're going to go back up to the top of the loop and you're going to, um, and I think the print statement is already there, so just use the print statement that they give you. Um, in the lab, but that's what you're going to do until tokens of zero is quit. When tokens of zero is quit, the whole thing quits and you're done. So um, this is one place where you, uh, just like the first lab, this is one place where you have to use um, a while loop. So these aren't huge. These are not huge like they were last week. But they expect that you understand indentation, that you understand your scope and your code blocks, and you understand how to increment and what, um, and yeah, and how to increment, especially this one. You have to make sure you get your incrementations right. You have to make sure that you're going to increment inner counter on the inner loop and you're going to increment counter only when it comes to the end of the outer loop. So I've talked a lot tonight. Does anybody have any questions? Going once, going twice. OK, I will have this up tomorrow on the YouTube channel. I'm going to stop the recording.